Welcome back to the Swamp 24-7 Podcast. I'm Thomas Goldcamp, joined here today by Blake Alderman. Trying something a little bit new for those of you that are listening through your normal avenue on the podcast. We're actually also going to upload today's episode to YouTube and try to expand our audience that way. So if you prefer to watch it there, uh, we will include some links in the description of the podcast to the YouTube channel so you can find it that way. Uh, but Blake, we're back. Uh, I think you know a little bit unexpected in that Florida usually starts spring practice kind of mid-March. And we found out last week that uh, the Gators ap- apparently are going to be playing uh, spring football about three weeks earlier this year. Uh, so we're, they're planning to start this week and then, you know, spring football should be wrapped up by the end of March. So, uh, I thought we had a little bit more time to kind of preview some of the things, you know, concerning the Gators going into 2021, but let's go ahead and dive into it. I wanted to start obviously with the biggest question, which now that Kyle Trask is gone is obviously quarterback. Um, I guess what's your general take on the quarterback position going into this fall, obviously, we're going to have a new starter, almost certainly Emory Jones. But what's your feeling about how that group sets up kind of for the future going forward? You know, I like the room overall. I think that Coach Mullen, um, Coach Johnson, who is you know now with the Philadelphia Eagles, but he was the quarterback coach and offensive coordinator, dealt a lot with the quarterback recruiting. I think they've done a really good job of building that room up. I like a lot of the guys in there. The only thing that I'm not crazy about is maybe the fully game experience. You know, sure, Emory Jones got plenty of snaps in there. You know, even Anthony Richard got his uh, Richardson got his feet wet at uh, certain times in the you know in that freshman season. But I think things will look a little bit different as far as dynamics go with the quarterback. And and I don't mean to say that Emory Jones isn't isn't a passer or isn't good at passing. But I think whenever you see what Kyle Trask did last year, I think you have to lower your expectations because Kyle Trask, I mean, he just had a phenomenal year. I mean, that's just the credit you have to give to him. I think you see some different ways they use the quarterback. I think Emory, obviously, he's very electric. He's very quick and, and kind of elusive when he runs. I think that dynamic he does bring as far as being able to stretch to play with his legs, I think that that's going to be something where maybe you see something that's – um a little bit more of a traditional type of Dan Mullen offense where you see a little bit more quarterback runs. And I think that can kind of trickle down to other spots on the offense too. You know, I think that could open up the run game just because you have to focus on Emory Jones. So, you know, again, just to, you know, kind of sum up what I'm saying, I think it'll look different because I think Emory Jones can do different things. I'm interested to see this spring, how he progresses as a passer. Um, You know, he had some throws over his career, you know, even that game where uh, in 2019, where uh, Kyle Trask got hurt for a couple of plays and Emory came in and he was still able to move the ball, you know, through the air. He had that one uh, pass, I believe it was to Jacob Copeland on the sidelines there that was, you know, it was kind of a ball that just Copley could get. So he's shown flashes. I'm interested to see if he can continue to really, you know, kind of keep his foot on the pedal and, and kind of broaden his passing game to go with that, what we know as, as a runner. Yeah, I was uh, trying to pull up uh, Emory Jones's statistics and uh, had it in the wrong window there. But uh, the one thing that concerns me, I think you, you mentioned it, you know, how, where is he going to be at as a passer now that he takes the reins full time? I think that's obviously the question for a lot of Florida fans. And, you know, when I was kind of reviewing, you know, positions for Swamp247.com, kind of providing a spring preview, one of the things that stuck out to me was that the more Emory Jones has gotten involved in the passing game over the last three years, the more his accuracy numbers have come down. And I think for me, that's concerning a little bit. Obviously, it's a very small sample size, but it's concerning to me because it seems like the accuracy numbers have gone down as his kind of use of the offense has expanded and, you know, as he's being put into more different situations. So it is going to be really interesting to see that. Having said that, I don't know that, well, obviously you're not going to replace what Kyle Trask did, but I don't know that you need Emery to be quite as successful as a passer. And I think a lot of that is because we fully expect Florida to shift more towards, like you said, that kind of traditional Dan Mullen offense where, you know, you're really basing things heavily around the zone read. And that kind of opens up things outside to where, you know, as defenders start stepping into the box, all of a sudden you've got more one-on-one matchups outside. You know, Florida's offense was so unique this year compared to previous Dan Mullen offenses in that, you know, the Gators played a lot of drop eight coverage and Kyle Trask was still good enough to be able to unlock that with his arm. Um, But Blake, I guess going forward, knowing that this is going to be most likely a more run heavy offense, let's talk about the running backs group because, you know, Emory Jones, I think is probably a little bit underrated as a runner. I think he's very slippery. Um, You know, you look at his numbers, certainly they, they bear that out. That you know, it's quick too. Like I mean, you look one quick. spot and you turn and look the other way, like he's gone. And that's what stands out to me is you know Florida's offensive line didn't really open a whole lot of holes for the backs, and yet Emory Jones was one of their most successful mm-hmm. runners. I think he's very slippery between the tackles. Um, but I also think when you look at this running back group, you've got a pretty diverse set of skills, and obviously 
you know, the addition of five-star running back to Marcus Bowman out of Clemson as a transfer will be huge. He's on campus this spring. Um, but Blake, I think, I think you almost have a kind of a log jam at running back. And I'm not sure that all of those guys, the three guys that got carries last year being Damian Pierce, Naquan Wright, and Malik Davis are all going to be able to get as many carries as they did last year. You know, I think the volume of carries as a whole is going to go up, but I'm curious how you see the running back room kind of shaking out in terms of touches. You know, it's an interesting question because, I mean, it, it is a bit of a log jam. You have so many different guys that can do some different things. You know, you've got, you know, Damian Pierce, who's more of a power guy. Um, you've got Malik Davis, who I think was a little bit more impressive as far as, you know, in the passing game. I thought he brought something there. You've got Bowman, who I think is more of a runner, not necessarily a strong passer. You've even got Lorenzo Lingard. Naquan Wright, I thought, was able to do a little bit of everything. So it's it's something to me that I think the coaches have to figure that out in the spring. They know what a lot of those guys do. You have to see what Bowman does in the spring when he kind of comes over from where he was at Clemson. Florida, I mean, he was one of their top targets in that class. So obviously they, they know what he can do. They really like what he can bring to the table. But I think spring is where you start to sort a lot of those things out just because, like you said, I mean, you have so many guys that can do different things. You've got so many guys that were contributors last year. You know, and, and you've got a guy like Demarcus Bowman who's coming in being, I think, like the number two running back, I think, for his recruiting class. So you're going to want to have him in there. You're going to want to see what he can do, and you're going to want to give him some touches because he's one of those guys that can really change the game like how he did in high school. You know, not the biggest sample size of what we saw when he was at Clemson, but a lot of those coaches at Clemson really praised what he did in practice. Is that coach speak? You know, you never know those type of things, but I mean, he's uber talented. You know what he's going to, you know, he's going to make your team better. So, to me, it's something I think you have to figure out in the spring, and that's just by giving those guys reps, continuing to see what they do with different looks, and and I think that's where things start to get sorted out. Like we kind of know what Damian Pierce brings to the table as a runner. We know Malik Davis is more of a pass catcher. You know, Naquan Wright maybe a, a kind of a balanced guy that has good vision. What is Bowman's skill set? I mean, what did you see out of him in high school, and and how does he fit? You know, kind of in terms of skill set. Like I said, you know, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but there were very few passes he caught out of the backfield. Mm-hmm. That's just the type of running style that, you know, Lakeland High School ran. I mean, they they have, I think I've been to a game and I think they ran it 95, 90% of the time. So, I mean, this isn't an offense he's coming from that's really pass heavy. He's very quick. Um, he's kind of got that low center of gravity, but he's also pretty thick for, I mean, his, I mean he's not a big dude, but he's got – He's got some where he can break through the tackle. So I think where he comes to the table is just having that home run breakaway speed because, I mean, he's a guy that if he can, you know, hit the edge or he can shake off a guy, I mean, he's, he's going to get into the secondary and he's going to start, you know, making some, he's going to start making some separation between defenders. So I would say his speed is probably the thing that's the most impressive to me. Better, better than any of the three backs that got carries last year. You think? I would say so. Yes. Okay. So I, I, I've been pretty vocal about this. I think he's too talented a guy not to get on the field And, uh, you know, a couple fans have asked, okay, well, what about, you know, Lorenzo Lingard? He's a former five-star. What gives you confidence in Bowman as opposed to, say, Lingard? And and my answer has been Lorenzo Lingard is is a little bit further removed from his high school playing days. Had an injury that affected him at Miami, obviously. So, to me, I look at it as apples to oranges. You know, Demarcus Bowman, like you said, limited number of carries, but he was getting carries at Clemson despite them having Travis Etienne and a really, really talented offense. And he's going to have a spring, too. You know, Lingard had that unfortunate to, to not ready. having the spring. So that, that put him a little bit behind the eight ball, too. But, I, I mean, I agree with exactly yeah. what you're saying for sure. So I, I don't know if he's going to be the number one guy, but I'm fully expecting him to bust into that rotation. And I think it's probably going to end up taking away a little bit of carries away from, I think, Malik Davis is the guy that kind of maybe gets lost in the shuffle a little bit. You know, we've talked about it a little bit on previous editions of the podcast. Maybe Florida can shift him into a little bit more of a pure pass catching role. You know, they lost Kadarius Tony in the slot. I don't know that, you know, Malik Davis is necessarily cut out to be a full-time slot receiver, but, you know, maybe you can get him involved as kind of a gadget guy, jet sweep guy, that kind of thing, and add another wrinkle of the offense that way. That way you're not losing Davis's playmaking ability, but you're also not losing out on what, you know, Demarcus Bowman can bring as an all-around runner. And then, Blake, I've made the point, I think Damian Pierce is the kind of guy that if you are going to go rotation heavy, let Damian Pierce stay fresh until the fourth quarter, and then you can bring him in and kind of let him go to, you know, go to town being a battering ram after defenses are a little bit tired. But I got to say, I like the potential for this unit. I think the running back group is... Probably the deepest. It's unit diverse on the team. too, with all the little things that they do differently. It, it's it's exactly what you want in a room like that. You know, for for as much flack that Greg Knox gets, because I know that you know the one high school guy he landed since he's been here has been Naquan Wright. But that room, you know, through the transfer portal and what that dynamic of that brings to recruiting and how you fill a roster now. I mean, it's still a. I mean, all things considered, from top to bottom, it's one of the more impressive rooms. Uh, you know, on Florida's position groups. And I, I go back to you know last year, I thought. 
the backs were all solid. Now you got to try to find somebody that's outstanding. And I think Bowman has that ability. Will he be able to unlock it at Florida? Well, let's shift to the offensive line because we've got major question marks there. Second year in a row last year where Florida really didn't generate much in the run game. And I go back and forth between um, the fact that Florida was so good passing, maybe they just didn't try to emphasize that as much, didn't practice it as much. I don't know if that's the case. That sounds a little bit like excuse making to me. I do know at the end of the day that Florida's going to have to be able to run block better if this offense is going to be as successful as it needs to be to to make up for some issues elsewhere. You know, the drop in the passing game that we expect, that kind of thing. Uh, Blake, what do you want to see happen on the offensive line this spring, whether that's in terms of, you know, a starting five group you think could work out or improvements that need to be made? What, what has to happen up front on the O-line this spring? You know, to me, it's that right side. You know, you bring guys like Stuart Reese back. You bring Jean DeLance back. You know, those were the guys where you look at Florida's offensive line. I mean, that right side, sure, the entire unit as a whole had some struggles, but that right side was the one that really was the more noticeable, you know, to where they just – you wanted to see more out of them. So, you know, those guys being back, I'm interested to see them start to kind of move some guys around. Sure, you lose, you know, uh, Brett Heggie, you lose Stone Forsyth, who was your starting left tackle. I think that that's one area where you can move Richard Garage – who I thought he struggled somewhat in that Oklahoma game with the, the snaps he did get at left tackle. Mm-hmm. But I think just having a spring, having the body style he has, he seems like the guy that's the more fit for being that left tackle type of guy. So, you know, I like him there, um, you know, moving around a guy there at left guard center, you have guys like, um, um, Oh man, Ethan white. I was about to say, I, he's like a board favorite. How could I forget his name? Ethan white, another guy there who has some flexibility of playing center and playing guard. So, Um, You know, they have some younger guys, you know, Michael Tarquin, you know, um, Josh Braun, you know, there are plenty of guys that I'm interested to see how they move in there and they move out. And if you can move them around, because just through the recruiting process, you've seen John Hevesy get some of those guys to where you look at him and you're like, is he a tackle or is he a guard? And sure, it's nice to have that type of position flexibility, but you want to start to see a little bit more uptick from that tackle position for Florida. I know Stone Forsyth was great, but I mean, he's a guy that was developed through the program. You want to, and now he's not there. So you want to see those guys take that next step, especially on that right side of the line. Will there be some guys moved in and out to kind of compensate for that? Or can you move? Is it just as simple as moving a guy like Stuart Reese over to the left side? Is he, is he, is he thrive more there? You know, I, I think that that's something to where you like the floor of the offensive line room because you have some guys that you know what they can do. You have some guys to what you think they can do, but I want to see them continue to kind of tinker with things in the spring because you want to see that ceiling get higher. Yeah. And I think to do that, you need to have some of these younger guys like Tarquin, like Joshua Braun really start to push for starting spots and maybe not just one or two of those guys pushing for starting spots. But when I look at it, I think there's four guys I've kind of highlighted who I think have the ability to take the next step and really push for, for starting jobs. Um, Ethan White's a guy that has already kind of been in that role a little bit, but he's one. I think he's going to be your starting center. Everything we've heard from every coach and player that's worked with him has been over the top raving about his football IQ. That was the plan, obviously, last fall going into fall camp, and then he had the knee injury and wasn't able to do it. And Brett Heggie really, to his credit, stepped in and performed great. But I think Ethan White's a guy that has all SEC potential, and Florida needs him to start to get there. I think uh, you know Kingsley Egwakan is another guy at center, potentially. And I think... If he's able to play center and and really make a push this spring, maybe you start to think about maybe moving Ethan White to attack. And I think that's ideal if you can do that, because I think Ethan White is really strong and he's good at he's good at those pulling type of blocks to where you've got a big dude that's just going to just get all the crap out of the way. He's going to clear Mm -hmm. those lanes. And I think that those are the type of strides that Florida needs to take on the offensive line next year. Is Ethan White the center for Florida? Is he the best there? That's great. But if you can get Kingsley there at center and you can move Ethan White out there to that guard position and kind of get him out there in some pulling situations, I think that's really ideal for Florida. Well, not only that, because if you're able to do that and, and Kingsley's able to step forward and take that starting center job, um, one, we've heard he has a real mean streak, which I think is something that this offensive line needs. But two, like you said, the flexibility to move Ethan White around, all of a sudden, if you've got Ethan White playing a guard spot, you can you have the flexibility to maybe try Josh Braun at tackle. And I think that's where you have maybe the potential for significant upgrades. You know, we talked about John DeLance being a little bit of a weak link. Obviously, a lot of experience. That's good. You know kind of what you're getting out of him. But you also know you kind of got to work around him a little bit. And if Florida can get guys that, you know, are actually able to kind of push and take over those jobs, I think that's what Florida needs. And look, it didn't happen last year. So, you know, somebody's going to have to take a step up, play a little bit better than they were a year ago, get the playbook down a little bit better. Um, but Blake, to, to your point, I do think that there's a lot more pieces to work with for Florida. And I think it's not like last year where a lot of those pieces are true freshmen or redshirt freshmen. 
you get to the point where the Tarquins, the Ethan Whites are going into their third year in the system. And really, you know, if you're a, if you're a coach like John Hevesy that hangs your hat on development, this is where you want to see them start to develop and step up because that offensive line has to play better for Florida's run game to work the way it's supposed to. And I think if it does, and Florida is able to have a pretty productive run game based on that zone read and Emory Jones, I think you go back to, you know, being able to get one-on-one matchups outside. And I think for this offense to work the way it's supposed to, you're going to need some of those one-on-one matchups. You know, you lose Kyle Pitts, you lose Kadarius Tony, you lose Trayvon Grimes. You look at receiver, and we'll talk about it here, you know, the guys coming back, the guys that maybe need to take a step up. There are some question marks. And it's not that those question marks can't get answered. We saw that happen in 2020. But it's going to have to happen in a different way this year, and I don't think it's going to be able to happen unless that offensive line steps up. But, Blake, let's talk about receiver. Um, am I as dire on this group as, as maybe it sounds? Because I look at it, you know, Jacob Copeland, Justin Shorter, those are two guys that have some experience. Both guys have been a little inconsistent to me. I want to see a little bit more. Yeah, you know, I think you bring a good point there. I mean, you know, I think that even, um, you know, guys like Xavier Henderson, you've got guys like Trent Whittemore. Xavier Henderson was obviously very young last year. Trent Whittemore had the unfortunate, you know, he was he was kind of banged up for a, a good portion of the year. But man, we were we were kind of down on this group heading into last season, and they exceeded our expectations a lot. And I think where you bring a guy like, you know, Eric Gilbert. You know, if he's able to play, you know, I don't know how the waiver situations go. I don't know. I, you know, th- there's still some things to sift through mm-hmm. from there. But you saw what Florida's group did when you have a guy like Kyle Pitts that could be that ma- that mismatch type of guy. You can move him around, different, do different things with him. And defense has started to focus on him. I think if you can get some production from him, I think that will kind of help transition along some of these wide receivers that maybe are a little inconsistent. Maybe we don't know so much about, you know, what, what they can do, you know, as they get more snaps, because now you're going to start seeing guys like, you know, even Jamarcus Weston, you know, Jaquavion Frazier, you're going to start seeing some of these other guys in the spring. Who's going to step up. Who's going to continue to a get a starting spot or B, you know, be there to provide some serious depth for the position. So I think if you can get Gilbert in there, I think that that starts to make things a little bit more comfortable with what Florida can do because, We've seen what they did with a guy like Pitts. If Gilbert can get that kind of production, I think it's going to take a little bit of that slack off of those other wide receivers. But if not, I mean, you're going to need some guys, like you said, I mean, they've been inconsistent. You know, Shorter obviously had that, you know, great catch in the Arkansas game, and then he kind of disappeared some with some drops in the Oklahoma game. So you really want to continue to get those guys just in the right mindset to take that next step from not being a depth guy, not being a guy that's maybe wide receiver three or wide receiver four. I mean, now you're one or two, you know, so those guys really need to take that next step up next year. But I think Gilbert can kind of help those, you know, hold their hand along as they, as they continue to take those strides. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the fact that he won't be on campus until May, um, you know, gives guys some opportunity to really carve out their roles before he arrives. Cause there's no doubt he's going to be a part of the offense, especially, uh, I mean, we're all assuming he's going to be eligible at this point with the, the NCAA likely adjusting the transfer rules. Seems um, like the NCAA has other things they want to focus on other than they're all over the place, man. Stuff, they're so. all over the place. But I do think, you know, to your point, I think Florida's done a really good job of developing receivers, you know, in the time that uh, Dan Mullen and Billy Gonzalez have been here. You know, we saw a group that kind of underproduced, you know, the Josh Hammond, Freddie Swain, Tyree Cleveland didn't really have a huge impact when, you know, Jim McElwain was in charge. And then all of a sudden Billy Gonzalez comes in. Those four, you know, have a really productive couple of years and off to the NFL. And then, Guys that we kind of doubted before 2020 began, like Kadarius Tony, end up really turning into these all-around receivers. I think, you know, if you're if you're optimistically looking at it, that's something that Jacob Copeland could very well do. I mean, he's got the physical ability, you know, as he continues to put in the work in the playbook and study and film. I think he's going to get better. And I, I just go back to Blake. I think particularly when we talk about these tight ends, I see Florida maybe being a lot more 12 personnel, maybe even some 13 personnel, meaning two tight end, three tight end sets, because I think. If you look at even just Kamori Gamble and Keon Zipper and take take Gilbert out of the picture for now, those two tight ends are, are probably one of the better tight end duos in the SEC. I mean, in terms of the returning production, their their knowledge of the system, that's a pretty good group to work with. And then I think, you know, with with what Florida is probably going to transition to in a more run heavy game, just being able to build two tight end sets and uncover, you know, kind of what the defense is doing by motioning those guys by slipping them out. Maybe you see, you know, the little tight end uh, shovel pass return that kind of thing. I think Florida is going to have a lot of options. You know, anytime you lose as much production as the Gators had, you're going to have question marks. And I don't, I don't think it's going to be a perfectly seamless transition. And again, that for me, that boils back down to more my questioning Emory Jones and and where he's at as a passer. Um, But I do think that this offense, though it will look very different, has the chance to really be productive next year. So, all right, Blake, let's take a quick break. I think you froze momentarily there, but we'll take a quick break. 
And when we come back on the other side, we will talk the Florida defense. Welcome back to the Swamp 24-7 Sports Podcast. I'm Thomas Goldcamp here with Blake Alderman. We've been previewing Florida going into spring football. The Gators expected to start up spring practice later this week, so we wanted to kind of give you an idea of our expectations of what we expect to see this spring, areas the Gators need to improve, areas we like, you know, groups that can maybe be strengths. Like, let's talk about the defense. Uh, obviously, there were significant questions about defensive tackle with Florida losing three seniors. The Gators went out and added Antonio Shelton from Penn State and, and Daquan Newkirk from Auburn, two guys that have a lot of experience in the Power 5 level. Uh, I think that really, to me, shored up that this defensive line actually has the chance to be a real strength for Florida next year. Yeah, you know, those were some guys they really needed when you just looked at how young they were going to be. I mean, you were two transfer portal, excuse me, transfer portal additions away from, you know, having Javon Dexter out there being a, a full-time starter who, y- you know, he's going to be a good, you know, good player. I mean, he's coming in with the accolades coming out of high school. He got some snaps last year, which isn't an easy thing to do in the sec being a freshman past that. I mean, it was, you know, a lot of other freshman guys, you know, it was Jalen Lee. It was, you know, um, uh, Lamar goods. It could have been, you know, even if some of the freshman guys that they signed this year. So mm-hmm. I think getting those types of guys, are they Band-Aid type of guys? To an extent, yes. But I think you're also getting some quality guys who came from Power 5 programs who have playing experience. And I don't think that there's any negative to getting a guy who has playing experience and getting two guys that know how to approach game weeks, know how to study, know how to be in the film room, because that's going to trickle down onto the other younger guys. It's going to continue to let them you know, be brought along because you're going to want to throw those younger guys in, the Javon Dexters, the Jalen Lees, you know, the, the Goods, all those kind of guys. You're going to want to get those guys in because Florida likes to shuffle their guys around. But you just don't have to count on a fresh freshman going into a season, which is, I mean, it's just something ideally that no team wants to do, you know, getting those guys in there like that on top of getting those guys with experience, they've got some size. Florida wants to get bigger in the trenches. They want to be able to push the pocket. And that's what they did getting those two guys like that. Well, I mean, you talk about size, not just those two. That's the number one thing that stands out to me when you look at these interior guys. I mean, Shelton, Newkirk, Jalen Humphreys, Goods, Lee, Christopher Thomas, Desmond Watson. All of those guys are over 315. I mean, Jervon Dexter is the only one that's not listed over 315, and he's a 6'6 freak. So, I mean, you've got some serious, serious athletic potential in this group. And I think more than anything, if, if Florida can simply be stouter in the middle, I think it, it frees up the defensive ends and the linebackers to go make a lot of plays. And I thought at times this year, that was a problem for Florida. You know, especially we've talked about it ad nauseum. Sure. You know, Kyrie Campbell being out, how much that affected the rest of the defense. I think these two guys coming in give you some leeway, like you said, to kind of let those freshmen develop a little bit more at a, at a more normal pace. And then most importantly to me, it allows you to keep Zach Carter outside on key running downs. And I think that was something that Florida struggled with last year. But again, across the board on this defensive line, you talk about Zach Carter being back. You know, we saw some really positive things out of Chris Bogle last year. Brenton Cox is a guy that we think, you know, is just scratching the surface of his potential. If he can bulk up a little bit, you know, maybe get a little bit better set in the edge. I think we're looking at a defensive line that has the potential to be one of the better lines in the SEC. Now, I, I want to wait to see how quickly Shelton and Newkirk kind of develop this spring, how quick they pick up the playbook. Um, but I look at this front four, and I think they have the chance to be really stout, which I think is going to be important because I think when you start looking at linebacker, Ventrell Miller had a heck of a year last year. I think he's a really good piece that you can work with in terms of leadership and communication. But we need to see more playmaking out of the group of linebackers that are kind of coming back this year. No doubt. And I think that that's the good thing that the spring brings is because you can start putting in some of those guys that you started to get their feet wet in the 2020 season. And now, you know, you got a guy even like Dewan Black who, you know, yes, he's going to miss spring football, but you're still bringing in talent. You know, is he mm-hmm. going to be a guy that's could have used a spring you know, season and get ready to go into that, you know, that fall season? Absolutely. But is he talented enough? Is he physical enough? Is he athletic enough to get in there and make some snaps in the fall? Absolutely. So, I mean, you even got guys that are coming in from this 2021 class that you're kind of like, mm, you know, could they do something? You know, you've got a guy like Jeremiah Williams who they're going to start to throw in that linebacker position. I think you still need to start looking at more some of those upperclassmen guys, the Tyron Hoppers, you know, some of those other guys that they've signed in previous classes. But I think it's time to where we need to start seeing, you know, you even lose a guy like James Houston. So, it's time. I think it's time to start seeing some, what the, some of those younger guys can do. You know, the Derek Wingos who didn't get a spring football season himself. So Florida has signed some talented guys at the linebacker position, but they just haven't been able to get them on the field. And I think that now is a time to where you start getting those guys that are maybe a little bit more talented 
maybe don't have as much experience, but this spring season is the chance to kind of test them, you know, see what they can do because you're going to really need, you're just going to need to shuffle some of those guys around and really kind of elevate that room. And I think that that's what you can do by playing some of those guys that, you know, flashed when they did play. Well, I think one of the big issues with Florida at linebacker last year was frankly, the linebackers were asked to do a lot because at times the defensive tackle play was subpar. And what I mean by that is you had guys like Amari Bernie who were frequently getting taken up by offensive guards, pulling through by tight ends, H backs coming through. And Bernie was not physical enough to kind of get off those blocks, at least early in the season. Now I thought he progressed a lot as the year went on. Uh, Same with Mahmoud Diabate. I thought he got a lot better as the year went on, but I think if those defensive tackles are able to occupy blockers a little better than they were last year, I think that's when you see somebody like a Diabate, somebody like a Hopper really start to shine because what that does is it allows those guys to go attack downhill. And I think when we saw Tyron Hopper flash last year, a lot of it was those plays where he was able to green dog blitz, you know, if the running back stayed in on bat- pass protection and he was pretty effective doing that. So now if you can get to the point where, you know, it's not just the green dog blitzes, but it's your defensive tackles or, or occupying blockers and, allowing the linebackers to kind of keep their eyes free to the backfield. I think you do have some guys that can really make some plays and have the potential to be a little bit more explosive than, you know, a James Houston or a Josiah Pierre who transferred out. So I, I like the potential. I'd like to see more from Derek Wingo. He's another guy that, you know, obviously, you know, had some different stuff that kept him off the field last year, just in terms of injuries, COVID, stuff like that. Um, but he's a guy that, you know, we talked about his leadership potential when Florida signed him. He's another one of those really athletic guys that if he can pack on a little bit more weight, uh, could be a potential difference maker. So I like the the group at linebacker. I do think, like you said, I think Florida needs to make it a point to really push that youth movement. And I, th- I think that's true at a lot of positions. You know, I, I've said it, I think offensive line, I think they really need to put, you know, put a big emphasis on getting those younger players involved. I mean, that's, that's what spring practice is for. And I understand kind of sticking with the seniors, especially last year, given the lack of spring ball, but If Florida wants to take the next step, we're on to Dan Mullen recruits now. You know, these are guys that they recruited to come play, so they fit their system. And if you can't get those guys kind of producing and playing at a higher level, then it starts to become an indictment on you. But, um, Blake, I do like the look at linebacker, I think. I do, too. That group's a little bit more. It's got a little bit better blend of experience than I think we're going to see in the secondary. You know, the secondary, I think, is going to be a big question mark for me, particularly at safety, you know, with those senior safeties gone. Um, what are you expecting to kind of happen in the secondary is in, in terms of who are the four or five guys that kind of emerge as the, the lead guys back there? You know, I, I have some guys to where I feel like, you know, no doubt they're going to play, you know, obviously a Kyer Elam, a Trey Dean, who I think he played better as a safety last year, especially in the run support game. He gets a little tangled up sometime in the passing. I thought Rashad Torrance was another guy at safety that really stuck out to me for being a freshman, having to be thrown in the fire quite a bit. Not an easy sure, position to play. It's not an easy position to play being a freshman for sure, but it's also he's very he seemed very mature. He seemed very, mm-hmm. you know, built to. I mean, I, I you know, the shortened even, you know, kind of off-season workouts. I mean, he was a guy that didn't look like a freshman. No. So I think whenever you see what he did last year, I, I I'm impressed. I think he's a guy that takes that next step this year. The other cornerback position is one where I'm not quite so sure. You know, is it a Jaden Hill? I feel like it's his position to lose. You've got a guy like Jason Marshall, who's a five-star player, who enrolled early, will be doing spring football practice. He's coming in trying to push for some playing time. Is that a starting spot? I'm not sure because you've even got guys like, you know, Jahari Rogers. You've got, a, you know, there, there are some other guys that Florida signed in previous classes that have been there. Kamar Wilcoxon is another guy who last year, you know, enrolled a little bit earlier so he could get there and get that fast track on his career. I think that it's Jaden Hill's position to lose. I, I do feel like that going in there. I think the spring is going to be determining that. A, where are some of these other guys, some of these other younger guys, are they going to be able to make an impact? Are they going to be able to push for some more playing time? Or B, is Jason Marshall just going to run away with this and just you know go absolutely crazy in the spring and just you know blow everyone away? I think there's still some questions there that I, I don't know that I can answer now. Like I said, I do feel like it's Jaden Hill's position to lose at the star position. I think you have to get a look at Trevez Johnson there. I think that, you know, being that that's another hard position to play as well, but I think sure. He was a freshman. Sure. He got, you know, caught sometimes with his pants down out there on the field where, you know, you just like, what is this guy doing? But he's a freshman. And then some of those plays he made, you were like, okay, this guy's going to have a really good career ahead of him. So getting that spring season for him, I think is going to be very important, but I, I think that those are probably the guys that I'm keeping the closest eye on. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think the other thing you have to remember is Florida has a new cornerbacks coach. They have a new safeties coach. Sure. So, so there's no favoritism in there. So at all. unless you're a Kyrie Elam, you can probably forget about seniority to a certain degree, at least more so than if you had the same coaches going you know, off the same evals. So 
uh, to that point, you know, I, I think Jaden Hill, you know, has some, some talent to him. I think he's, he's got some experience. Um, but it wouldn't be surprising to see a new coach Not at all. look at, you know, a guy like Jason Marshall and be impressed by him. Or, you know, I, I thought Jahari Rogers and the limited looks he got was pretty good. I thought he played very good in the Oklahoma game. From so, what he did play. You know, and, and then Torrance obviously dealt with some injuries, but I really like the look of that guy. I mean, he, he is, you know, physically in shape to play in the SEC from day one. And I think, um, you know, I think, I think he's he definitely be- looks like a dude. He was a guy that even kind of going through the recruiting process where you saw his, you know, his tape, I, I think he had something like 110 somewhere in that ballpark tackles his senior year. So I mean, that's that's what you want from those younger guys. You want someone who's going to tackle. You know, sure, you, you're going to get caught with some coverage busts. You know, it happens as a younger guy. You can you need to continue to improve those as you go along. Mm-hmm. But man, if you can tackle as a freshman or maybe even a like you know a redshirt freshman or something, those are the guys that you see you know making an impact. And then another guy I don't know that we talked about is Trey Dean. You know, I think sure. when you have a new, I coach think he's going to be the other safety too. But I, I do think yeah. you bring a good point with that. You know, he's not he's not a lock because again. Again, new guys. Yeah. Well, but on the flip side, I think, you know, when you have a guy like Trey Dean, who obviously did get involved early and kind of had some issues with confidence as, you know, things didn't go well. Sometimes you get a new coach come in, just a fresh, feels like a fresh start. And if, you know, you have to go out and have a really good spring, all of a sudden you can feel like, you know, this is my year. And I thought he played well at times. I thought, you know, from a physical standpoint, I thought he was what Florida needed in terms of, you know, being fast enough to get downhill and hit hard. And, um, right. You know, obviously communication's big in the secondary, but I think he's a guy that's been around long enough. I mean, Florida's not going to completely change what they do schematically, even if they do change up some of the lingo or whatnot in the back end. Uh, so I think he's another guy that you can count on. But um, overall, Blake, I guess, thoughts on the defense as a whole? Because obviously Florida was pretty bad. I mean, really historically bad from a statistical standpoint last year. Do you feel like last year was maybe a little bit of a one-off or – do you think we're still going to see some some struggles going forward? You know, I really like the front seven. You know, just from the defensive line last year, there there were guys playing out of position, and Florida still had one of the better defensive lines, you know, in the SEC last year. So I, I like that group. It's a lot to put on two transfer guys to continue to kind of keep that trend of having you know a top one, two, three, or four defensive line in the SEC. But I I think that with the size they bring and how that's going to help free up some of those linebackers, ideally at least, you know, kind of where I'm at now, I think that it helps that front seven overall. The secondary last year with just how bad they were was that, you know, because obviously Torian Gray's gone, Ron English is gone. Is that a coaching thing positional-wise? Is it something that still trickles down from, you know, Todd Grantham's scheme being the defensive coordinator last year? I'm not sure, you know, or is it just the fact that some of those upperclassmen guys, you know, like a Marco Wilson, you know, some of the other guys they had around there, they just they just were struggling. You know, Sean Davis, who continued to have the same problems that he's had, you know, through his career of just, you know, maybe taking a bad angle or, you know, being more of a run type guy or going for a big hit instead of wrapping up. I think that I like the defense a lot better in the secondary with just what I've seen from some of those guys. Obviously, Kyer Elam is very talented. I think from seeing Trey Dean play corner star and then safety, I think safety seems like his best spot. I really like Rashad Torrance, again, just being a younger guy. I think there's still some questions to that other cornerback position. I think there's still a little bit of questions for me at star just because I, again, I like Johnson there. I like what he did last year, but I think that it's not his, his spot. You know, I don't think he's locked that up. I think that there are some guys that could come in and still do different things or maybe even, you know, make a press in the spring. Overall, I think the defense, I like it a lot better heading into the season, new coaches, you know, will they bring a breath of fresh air? Like you said, and kind of get those guys confident back up. I, you know, it's hard to say, man, because, you know, what if they go out and, you know, the secondary still struggles, you know, but I think that just from where I, what I've seen and seeing what I think that the linebacker, because again, I think the linebackers are key because they can help stop the run. They continue to get some of those guys a little bit more athletic to drop back in the passing game and do different things there. Or even just a guy like, you know, off the edge, where, you know, like you said, Chris Bogle, you've got Brenton Cox. Some of those guys can continue to get in the face of a passer, make him uncomfortable. Those things are going to help your secondary. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I think from overall, I think I like the group a lot more than I did last year, but I would still like to see, you know, some reports of how spring goes going forward to really kind of throw my hat in the ring on that, you know, Florida's defense is going to take that next step, but I do feel like they can. Yeah. I thought the biggest, the biggest issue defensively, and this is going to sound crazy given how bad the secondary was, but if you look from 2018, 2019 to 2020, what 2020 was missing was they didn't have a guy that could beat elite offenses up front in the front seven. And when you don't have a guy that can win one-on-one matchups against the best teams in the league, you know, they're going to hold their own and give you a lot of time to throw. And I thought that was a big issue for Florida. So I'm really curious to see if a guy like, you know, Brenton Cox can take the next step, if a guy like Chris Bogle can take the next step and really turn into um, a guy that not just 
you know, racks up big numbers because they're, you know, they're, they're putting up numbers against the teams that aren't as good, but can they have that Jonathan Grenard type impact that, you know, Ja'Kai polite type impact where they're putting pressure on opposing offenses against the really, really good teams in the tough matchups. To me, that's going to be where the defense takes the next step. I think, you know, with the talent, in the secondary that you talked about, some of the youth, there's going to be some growing pains, but I think you can make that a lot easier if that front seven that we talked about now having a little bit more size, uh, you know, maybe getting guys a little bit more in their probably proper positions. If they can have the kind of impact that they can, then I think this defense suddenly looks a lot better. And we may look back at 2020 and say, oh, well, we just we just didn't have a dude up front. And that really exposed us in the back end. But Blake, I know that I'm fired up to start spring football. Uh, we're supposed to talk to Dan Mullen, I believe, tomorrow. A uh, little bit short on communication from USN, so don't don't hold me to that. Uh, but we are fully we're expecting. We're fully expecting to start spring practice later this week. And as you guys know, I don't I don't know what the media setup will be like just yet. Unfortunately, I'm not really holding my breath on the idea that we're going to be able to see some open practices or anything like that, given COVID nineteen still lingering. But we will do our best, obviously, Bob Redman, myself, Blake to kind of hit our sources and, and figure out what's going on in spring ball beyond just what you hear in the press conferences. So be sure to tune into swamp247.com this week, guys. We appreciate you listening to this episode of the podcast. We'll be back next week talking the first week of spring football. Thanks for tuning in.